I'd like to uh, welcome you here tonight for the last of this semester's uh, David S. Sauerman Provocative Lectures. Uh, my name is Jack Estel. I'm a lecturer with the Economics Department here. And um, we're glad to see so many people here, particularly our students. Tonight, we've had several students who have worked all semester long to create a program for us. They have created a new organization called Students for a Provocative Discussion. The uh, moderator tonight is Siobhan Thompson. Siobhan is a graduate of San Jose State with a bachelor's degree in history, and she's currently working on a master's degree in theater. So let's welcome her tonight. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. This is a very uh, special day for me. It's almost a year in the making. We have been working on this uh, for quite a while. This is the first student-organized uh, provocative discussion, and it is organized umbrella-like through the economics department. Uh, again, my name is Siobhan. I am going to moderate this discussion. Uh, this project, just to give you a little background, was inspired by a project that is uh, from Brown University over in the East Coast, and they are called the Janus Forum. They take controversial political socioeconomic issues and they discuss them in an academic and intellectual fashion. We have uh, taken that model and applied it here to issues specifically affecting San Jose State and the student culture. And our students that are involved with this, uh, we're coming from different departments. I'm from history and theater. We've got Alejandra down here. She's from economics. Then we've got Tony there at the end. He's a master's student with the economics department. Jeremiah is a graduating senior in communications. And then Dawn is another master's student in the economics department. So just to get right to it, our topic today is a multifaceted analysis of the American immigration policy. We will hear from three speakers who will bring three different perspectives on the topic. Again, this is not a debate. It is an academic discussion. However, opinions are invariably going to be argued by the speakers. And our intent is to provide information so that we can all make an educated opinion about the current immigration policy. Our first speaker is Professor Brian Kaplan here at the start. He's a professor of economics at George Mason University, and he will give us background on the history as to how the policy came to its current state while showing us ideas on an open border policy. Following Mr. Kaplan, Christopher Fleischett is an immigration attorney based over in Menlo Park, and he will give us a picture of the policy in practice. He has been practicing law since 1985 with Finn and Fleischett and Associates. And following him, Marjorie Hazeltine will wrap up our discussion. She's a lecturer here in the communications department uh, at San Jose State, and she did her master's work at uh, Chapel Hill in a uh, really interesting thing, uh, performance studies. So she'll tell you a little bit of, uh, more about that. We will finish with uh, some awards that we have to get out for the essay contest that we provided. After that, we'll move into Q&A. The panelists of students will start with the questions. After that, we'll turn it over to the audience. Alejandra will have a microphone, so just kind of indicate if you have a question. Let's get started. All right, I'm going to start with a little thought experiment, and it goes like this. Uh, suppose that moved by the plight of Haiti after the earthquake, you go down there, you engage in some earthquake relief, uh, you help out for two weeks, and then you head to the airport to go home. Uh, when you get to the airport, you are told by the airline that you are not cleared for return to the United States, and you ask why, and they say you're going to have to go to the U.S. Embassy to find out. You go to the U.S. Embassy, and they say, tough luck, you can't go back. And you ask, why not? And they say, we don't have to give reasons. The United States government does not have to give you any reason why you're not allowed to go to the United States. All right, it seems that this would be wrong. It seems to be morally wrong to tell someone that they can't move to the United States for no good reason at all. all right, so again, if they were to say, you're a murderer, we don't want you in our country, right, that seems plausible, or a thief. 
right? Uh, or they might say, well, what's so bad about Haiti? And you'd say, well, uh, there's a lot of problems with Haiti. You know, there's poverty, death, oppression, isolation, right? Uh, the people that I want to hang out with are not here in Haiti. I want to go home. And they still might say, that's too bad. Now, the point of this thought, thought experiment isn't to say this is some kind of certain proof that immigration restrictions are wrong. Uh, there are a lot of things that seem wrong on the surface that turn out to be justified. So just imagine describing surgery to someone who doesn't know what it is. You say, well, we go and we take a knife and we chop open somebody's body and we fish around and we remove something and we sew you back up again. Right? And you might say, that's terrible. How can you justify this? You say, well, it's to save your life. <clears throat> it's to save your life. You say, oh, well, in that case, it's okay. If you're chopping me open and removing body parts to save my life, and, I go, and I'll, so I've consented to it because I understand the point, then it would be okay. All right, so I'm not claiming that the mere fact that immigration restrictions seem wrong initially shows that shows they're wrong, but it does show that there, there ought to be some kind of a reason. Right? There ought to be some kind of a justification. Well, in other words, the point of the thought experiment is that there is what I'll call a presumption against immigration restrictions. There's a reason to think that they're bad, which has to be overcome. Right? And the theme of this lecture is that proponents, people who favor immigration restrictions, which is virtually everyone, by the way, right, as you probably know, uh, proponents have to show that the evils of immigration somehow overcome this presumption, but also, and equally importantly, that there's no more humane or cheaper way to handle the problems that they're complaining about. All right, so over on the right, I have one of my favorite lines from The Simpsons. Uh, this is uh, Bart saying, Lisa, I only lied because it was the easiest way to get what I wanted. All right, there's a general presumption against lying. Sometimes lying is perfectly okay. If there's an ax murder who asks you where the children are, and you could say, well, they are across town, in the, out in the swamp. You'll find them if you look hard enough. All right, that is a perfectly fine time to lie. I urge you to lie if this ever occurs to you. Right? But merely saying I'm lying to get what I want, it's the easiest way to do it, is not much of a way to overcome the presumption against lying. All right. So uh, now we're thinking about overcoming the presumption. So how is it that you might overcome the presumption in favor of open borders or against restriction of immigration? Right, so I'm now going to go very quickly through the four main arguments, and we can talk about them more in Q&A, but I'm just going to try to hit the high points. All right, so probably the first most common argument in favor of immigration restrictions is that they protect Americans from poverty, which would be caused by low-wage competition. Another common one is that immigration restrictions protect American taxpayers from welfare state exploitation. So the complaint is immigrants would come here and collect welfare and pay no taxes, and they'd be a burden on us. Uh, another complaint is they're necessary to protect American culture. And a final complaint uh, is that they're necessary to protect American liberty. Again, there may be additional arguments, but I'm just trying to hit the high points. Okay, so let's start with the first one, where, as an economist, I'll claim to know the most about, uh, protecting Americans from poverty. All right, so there's a simple story here which uh, makes a lot of sense when you hear it at first. So if you know anything about the world, you will know that a billion people on Earth <clears throat> live on a dollar a day or less in income. A billion people on Earth survive on a dollar a day or less. They would love to move here. They would love to move here. It's so much better here than it is, than it is there. I mean, there are plenty of surveys of people in these countries finding that a large number, often a majority, say they want to permanently leave their country. Okay? And the next part of the story is just uh, supply and demand. It says if they did move here, if the, uh, then American wages would plummet. Okay? So all sounds pretty good, but the story actually has many holes which have been explored by economists who work in the area. So first key point. Low-skilled wages are likely to fall. Yes, low-skilled wages are likely to fall, but most Americans are not low-skilled. Right? Most Americans are much better educated, much better trained than people on Earth who live on a dollar a day. Right? Many of them are not even literate. Right? So they are supplying a very different kind of labor, the kind of labor that you're more likely to buy the services of than to compete with. Okay? Now, when estimates have been made of how much difference has immigration made for low-skilled wages, Never mind wages in general, but low-skilled American wages, uh, the estimates have generally been very small. Right? So George Borjas, who is the most academically respected critic of immigration in the entire world, uh, if you go to his textbook on labor economics, you can go to the relevant table and find his own results. And his claim is that decades of low-skilled immigration in the United States have reduced the wages of natives who dropped out of high school by about 4.8%. So they have reduced the wages of the very lowest skilled Americans, those who didn't even graduate from high school, by 4.8%, not 4.8% per year, not 48%, but 
4.8% for many, many millions of immigrants who have come here. Right? So a difference that is really quite small. Right? Furthermore, there are also offsetting benefits for American employers, American investors, uh, American consumers, and uh, finally, American landowners. Uh, and since you're in California, this is probably especially relevant to you. So you might wonder, what would happen to California real estate prices if every Mexican immigrant went home today? or were deported, or simply said, I'm sick of being insulted here and I'm gonna go home. Right, so, uh, the, and the work here has found that, in contrast to the small effect of immigration on wages, there's actually a large effect of immigration on real estate prices. Immigrants have done a lot to boost real estate prices, and if their immigration were to be reduced, the low California real estate prices would go uh, considerably lower. Okay, now we move to the, the key point about uh, whether or not there's any cheaper and more humane way of handling the problem. So even if the complaint were true, even if it really were true, that letting in a lot of immigrants would substantially reduce American wages, uh, there is clearly a cheaper and more humane alternative, which is to freely admit immigrants, but charge them an admission fee or a surtax. So either let them in, but say it costs $10,000 to come, or let them in, but say if you want to come here, then you have to pay an extra 10 percentage points in your taxes. And then you use the money to compensate native workers. Right? So you can, you can take the complaint at face value, and there is still a cheaper and more humane way of dealing with it than just saying you can't come here. All right. Uh, next attempt to rebut the presumption that immigration restrictions are necessary to protect American taxpayers. So again, there's a simple story. Uh, the American welfare state pays more for idleness than many countries pay for work. Right? So naturally, immigrants come to abuse the system. A standard story. Okay. Uh, this goes against one little known but unarguable fact about how the American welfare state works which is that most of the money goes to the old, not the poor. Right? We spend a lot more money give, uh, a lot more money on the American elderly, regardless of their income, than we do on people who are poor. Okay? And new immigrants tend to be young. New immigrants tend to be young, uh, which means that just based upon the way that our programs are structured, uh, immigrants are not able to collect nearly, nearly as much as we imagine. Uh, and the upshot of this is that when researchers have tried to estimate the fiscal impact of immigration, while, of course, the answers do vary, uh, nevertheless, almost no serious research, researcher finds a big negative fiscal effect of immigration. Some find a positive effect, some find a neutral effect, some find a small negative effect, but almost no one has found a big negative effect. And if you think this is absurd, remember this. Much government spending is what economists call non-rival. Uh, these are things where it doesn't matter how many people are around when you figure out how much they cost. So immigrants actually help spread the cost of national defense. When you get more immigrants, you don't need more nuclear weapons. Right? And they also spread the cost of debt service. So when more immigrants arrive, this means there are more people who have to share a fixed amount of debt that the U.S. government owns, the U.S. government owes. Okay? So more people in means that the share that, are, that is borne by every existing person uh, is smaller. Now again, even if this complaint were true, uh, once again, there is clearly a cheaper, more humane alternative which is to free them in immigrants, but make them ineligible for benefits. So you can give them a guest worker pass. So you're allowed to come here to work, you're not eligible for benefits. And this would certainly be better from the point of view of immigrants. Far better to hear that you're allowed to come but can't collect benefits than to hear that you are not allowed to come at all. All right, another complaint. Uh, that is, uh, immigration restrictions are necessary to protect American culture. So the complaint is immigrants are destroying American culture so they won't learn English, they won't fit in, they dress funny, they smell funny, and so on. All right, now there's an obvious problem here. So even Huntington, who is one of the main advocates of this cultural argument, uh, he admits that over 90% of second generation Mexicans speak fluent English. Right, so it doesn't seem to be that the children of the original generation of immigrants are not learning English. Of course, the first generation often does not speak fluent English, but that's always been true. Right, so the second generation is learning fluent English, uh, an overwhelming majority. So it seems like that argument doesn't work, even in terms of people who are friendly to the argument. Now here's a deeper problem. Uh, if you go and take a look at what we would consider America's cultural centers, uh, so uh, California is generally considered one of them, Hollywood, so on, uh, New, York for, New, 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 York, uh, New York for television, Broadway, so forth, Washington, D.C. for Kennedy Center, Smithsonian, so on. All right, now if you take a look at its cultural centers in places like California, New York, well, and compare them to what we would call, uncharitably, the cultural wastelands. And no offense if you're from there. There's plenty of nice things about the cultural wastelands, and high culture isn't for everyone. Uh, but still, uh, I don't know anyone who would argue that, say, North Dakota, South Dakota, Arkansas, Alabama, Montana, or West Virginia have an enormous variety of cultural offerings. And I don't know that, there, that if you were to go and hang out at the West Virginia airport, I don't think you'd ask people, so what are you here? What are you here for? I don't think people would often say, I'm here for the culture. All right. 
Now, uh, even if this complaint were true, once again, there are cheaper and more humane alternatives. So if the complaint is people immigrants won't learn English, then we could admit anyone who passes an English fluency exam. Uh, if you think that there's some broader sense of culture, uh, then you could say, we'll admit you if you pass a test of cultural literacy. So and now I would like to add that you probably should want to have a test that half of native born Americans can pass. So we start putting on things like name five operas, uh, you're gonna find that most Americans are not culturally literate either, uh, but uh, still. All right, now last complaint, which is popular among many of my friends, <laughs> Uh, so this is the most popular excuse uh, for immigration restrictions among libertarians. Say, look, immigrants come from status countries, from countries where people don't have and don't want freedom. And if you let them in, they will come here, they will vote, and they're going to ruin our country too. Right? So they're going to flee their own country that they ruined with their horrible voting, and they're going to turn our country into the mirror image of the places that they ran away from. Right? So at minimum, once again, this problem is greatly overstated. Uh, first of all, non-natives have low turnout, which strangely is sometimes held against them think that if you complain that they're not going to vote well, at least you'd say, but thank God they don't vote very much, but some people will say both. First of all, they vote poorly, and second of all, they don't vote. <laughs> hmm, can't we just have one complaint here? Uh, yeah. uh, somewhat similar to the simultaneous complaint that they take all our jobs and they won't work and they're on welfare. Okay. We limit ourselves to one of the two complaints, please. All right, in any case, so non-natives have low turnout, uh, and this is true even controlling for other factors like education. Right? And, but more importantly, something that is rarely discussed, but again, there is very good data to support this, uh, immigrants reduce native support for the welfare state because people don't like helping out groups. So if you look at where you have the largest and most comprehensive welfare states in the world, generally they are in culturally and ethnically homogeneous countries. So Scandinavia has changed a bit in recent years, uh, you know, so that uh, they, are, they are famous for being countries where basically everyone is blonde haired and blue eyes, and uh, in countries like this, Traditionally, people don't complain about welfare because the best complaint about welfare that you can usually make is there's a bunch of people who don't look like us who are all ripping us off and collecting. So if everyone looks Swedish, then you can't really make this argument. I just look, well, what do you mean? They're blonde hair and blue eyes just like us. They're perfectly good Swedes. They just happen to need some help. Oh, sorry, my mistake. I thought that they had a different hair color and therefore might be lazy. <laughs> all right. So it is generally true that countries that are more ethnically, ethnically and culturally homogeneous have bigger welfare states because people don't mind supporting big government if big government helps people who look and look and talk and act like them. Right? So if you think that the welfare state is a bad idea then, there's actually a reason for you to want more immigration in order to undermine support for it so that people start to resent the fact that they are supporting people that they think aren't actually, that they think are not reciprocating. All right? So the net effect is probably to shrink the welfare state and again, uh, you know, the best evidence for this is just where do we have the smallest welfare states in the Western world? Well, uh, the, U the U.S. Uh, does less for the poor than most other countries in Western Europe. And again, a standard story about this is just that the U.S. has more ethnic heterogeneity. And uh, there's a book called Why Americans Hate Welfare, uh, which I think argues this very persuasively. Uh, so um, that's, a, I think, a pretty good story. But once again, you know, even if the complaint were true, uh, there is, again, a cheaper and more humane alternative to keeping people out because they won't vote the right way. And that is how about we freely admit immigrants to work and live, but not to vote. So you're allowed to come here. You can do everything except vote, right? Because we're worried that you're going to ruin the country that you are coming here to enjoy. Right. So uh, the verdict. Uh, so I will say that the standard arguments fail to overcome the presumption against immigration restrictions. The problems that restrictions purport to solve are at best grossly exaggerated. Uh, there's a lot of wishful thinking, or really it's more of the opposite of wishful thinking. Right? It's thinking that things are way worse than they really are, assuming the worst without evidence, even though pe when people do look at the evidence, they find the situation looks much better than it appears. But in any case, even if you disagree, right, even if you think that my summary of the social science is unfair and biased, I will still say that you don't need to do any further research to realize that there are certainly cheaper and more humane alternatives to what we have. Things like entry fees. You know, is it fair to charge someone to come into this country just to work? I don't think so, but it's a lot less unfair than to say you can't come at all. Far better to say you can come in if you, if you pony over $10,000 to help Americans who dropped out of high school than to say you can't come no matter what. Similarly, uh, surtaxes, right? Are they fair? You know, I don't think so, but it's a lot less unfair to say you can come if you agree to pay an extra 10 percentage points in your taxes than to say you can't come no matter what. Uh, welfare eligibility, eligibility requirements. So saying you're not allowed to, you know, you're ineligible to collect welfare, you know, how long? Well, far better to say you can never collect a dime no matter what than to say that you can't come at all. Uh, so fluency test, if you really think it's that important for everyone to speak English, 
Uh, then say you can come here if you are able to pass a test of English fluency. Again, hopefully one that, say, most Americans who were born here could pass. Uh, <laughs> culturally, cultural literacy tests, again. So yeah, you might want to have the cast of friends or whatever else you think is required to be an American in good standing. Right? <laughs> or see, I guess now it would be like if you name as many members of Jersey, you remember the cast of Jersey Shore as possible. Then, then it shows that you are familiar and conversant with American culture and can fit in and assimilate to our society. Uh, voting restrictions. Again, you may say it's not fair to not let people vote. Well, it's a lot less unfair than saying you can't vote and you also can't come here. In fact, if most people said, look, you could either come here but can't vote or you can vote but can't come here, uh, almost everyone on earth would say, well, you know what, I'd rather be here and not vote than be stuck in Haiti with the right to cast an absentee ballot. Right? So the ultimate argument for immigration restrictions, I'm afraid to say, it comes from uh, Nelson Muntz, which is the classic bully's argument. You're breathing my air. You're breathing my air. Going to a person who is doing nothing, harming no one, and then claiming ownership over the air in order to come up with an excuse for you to bully and mistreat them. So, and uh, there, I will leave it there. Thank you. My, that was provocative. <laughs> Very enjoyable. Um, my name is Chris Fleischut, and I'm an immigration lawyer, so what I'm going to offer tonight is a bit of perspective on the system that exists, not to defend it uh, so much as just to help elucidate what it is, as a, as a bit of a counterfoil, perhaps, to what Brian's been saying, although I, I don't disagree with many of the, the things you're pointing out. I think it's incredibly important that the immigration discussion include uh, understanding of economics, labor market studies, and demographics, and that, uh, that we pay attention to those studies, because they do tend to show that a lot of the concerns we have about immigration, about the numbers of immigration, are, are really passing concerns. And these studies also indicate that, uh, as a nation, we should be planning for the future and, and using immigration policy perhaps to in, invest in our future and create a better future. Uh, one recent study I, I read was that uh, it's, uh, of course we all know that as countries become more affluent, uh, the birth rate will go down and they will start to have uh, labor shortages in certain occupations and that's of course the case here in the US. Um, but it, actually a recent study says that that's gonna happen in Mexico. It's starting to happen in Mexico. So at some point, uh, Mexicans probably won't be coming to the U.S., or maybe we're going to have to entice them to come here uh, if we want them to work in the U.S. Um, another aspect of, uh, that we should be paying more attention to when we think about immigration is our own collective and personal, if you will, evolutionary baggage. Uh, and some of this Brian has also alluded to, that there is a strong force in all of us in, in our societies to reject the other. And of course, we, we come from a tribal past uh, where perhaps it was, it was necessary uh, to do that, to fight off the other in order to, to have access to resources. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the global world we live in today, it seems we need to work our way through some of those uh, instinctual responses we have to the other. And I know Marjorie's going to address some of those issues. Uh, also, of course, as an immigration lawyer, I would like people to have a better understanding of the immigration law itself uh, and what, what does exist. And in many debates, when you talk to people, of course, immigration is a very emotional thing. Um, you, you realize that, that people sometimes seem to, to feel that there's no immigration law at all and that why are these people here, how did they get here, uh, they must just be here illegally. Some, of course, are here illegally, but there is an immigration law, and there is an immigration law that, that tries to effectuate certain public policies. Whether it does so very well is another question. Um, the, the, uh, so what I would like to talk about for a few minutes is just to give some, some ideas of what the law is, and not, not a detailed analysis, but what the law provides for and, and point out some of the things it does not provide for. So immigra the immigration law, first of all, is based on the Constitution and interpretation of the Constitution 
which found that the power to regulate foreign affairs and by extension uh, immigration is something that was delegated to the federal government and not to the state governments. And it was de delegated to the Congress to, to legislate immigration. Now, it's, it doesn't say that precisely in the Constitution, but that's the way it's been interpreted. The Commerce Clause, as well as the Foreign Policy uh, Power Clause, uh, both have been interpreted to, to mean that the US Congress and the US federal government should have the primary uh, power over to regulate immigration, uh, both to the US and, of course, uh, commerce within the US. Um, the, the law, of course, does try to uh, regulate immigration. It, it, it does have a presumption, which Brian alluded to, that if you're, if you're not with us, you don't get in unless we let you in. And it, it, you know, it probably is, is trying to uh, effectuate a public policy. Well, if you have a nation, uh, the nation has to have some definition, it has to have some sovereignty, and the people in the nation have to be participating, particularly in a democracy, so they should have citizenship and be able to vote. And of course, people who come here who don't have citizenship can't vote. So the idea would be that ultimately, to create a society that has many citizens and many non-citizens would, would undermine the, 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 the civic um, uh, texture. The, the law creates uh, agencies that try to regulate immigration. They're the Homeland Security, uh, of course, is involved. The Foreign Service is involved. The Foreign Service are the people that man the consulates uh, in, in foreign countries, and they're the ones who tell people, as Brian said, you can or you can't come to the U.S. And it is very true that in many cases they don't have to tell you why. And that's, I think, a very big problem in the immigration law. Um, the immigration law creates a number of, a whole variety of temporary visas for all kinds of purposes, uh, visitors visas, student visas, temporary work visas, uh, visas for diplomats, visas for correspondents, uh, visas for people who come to testify in criminal trials, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, there is a presumption in the law that you are coming to immigrate unless you can convince the U.S. consular officer that uh, you are not going to. So the presumption, so each person who applies for a visa, a temporary visa, has to prove that he or she, uh, if the visa requires that they prove that they go back, which most do, they have to be able to prove that they're likely to go home. And that's the reason most visas are denied every day around the world that are denied, because the consular officer decided that the person did not bear that burden of proving that he or she would go home. Um, the permanent immigration law creates U.S. permanent resident status, and it tries to effectuate some reasonable public policies, I would think, about who do we let in to become permanent in the U.S. And uh, basically, there are three categories. There's family reunification, there's labor-based visas, and there are visas for refugees and political asylees, people who are fleeing persecution around the world. The, the system uh, is pretty reasonable, except that it's just not quite in touch with what it needs to be right now. Uh, it, it allows visas for spouses of citizens, spouses of permanent residents, uh, children of citizens and permanent residents, brothers and sisters of permanent residents. It doesn't allow very many visas for those more distant relations. One of the big problems in the system is that treats uh, the spouse or minor child of a U.S. citizen as an immediate relative who can get a visa and come immediately to the U.S., but the spouse of a permanent resident has to wait under a visa quota that in some cases takes many, many years. Uh, the, the law reasonably tries to say, let's have visas for everybody. Let's not have one country take all the visas. So there are country limits on visas. But the problem with that is that it ignores the fact that some countries have very strong historical ties to the U.S., such as Mexico, uh, such as the Philippines, and it only gives them the same number of visas as it gives someone, the nationals from Belgium or Luxembourg. 
So it's not so much that it's unfair that, that we create a system where every, the visas are spread out, but certainly it's, it seems to, it's not working very well that we don't give more visas to those countries that have such close ties to the U.S. Um, the, um, the employment-based system tries to give visas to people who have skills that are in short supply or, or who have excellent credentials who will help grow the economy. Um, it, it, it's a great idea. Uh, what I think should happen is there should be more visas for, for other types of workers other than the most highly skilled professionals because as we all know the U.S. does need, or we don't all know, but I'm hoping that we will begin to understand that the U.S. has real needs for other areas of work uh, including lower paid and lesser skilled jobs and that these are important roles in the economy as well. Um, so, so the problem that we face right now is that the U.S. Congress has not been able to act for many years and they're stuck between the restrictionists who are basically saying we're not going to pass any law until all the illegals are gone, and which of course is not likely to happen, and those people who are trying to do reform that will help make the system more reasonable and more sensible and more flexible to let in the types of skilled workers we need in the future to let in um, more <coughs> relatives of citizens. There are a lot of different small fixes that could be made in the law that would, would alleviate some of those hardships. Uh, the, the last law that was passed in 1990 was extremely restrictionist and it created all kinds of punitive penalties at a new level that did not exist in the law previously. So um, it is true that if you've lied to a U.S. consul, you won't get a visa. If you lie to immigration or use a false document, you're not supposed to get a visa. If you're the president of the United States and you lie under oath, you're supposed to be in trouble. Uh, but it, it, it turned, what, what it doesn't understand is that, uh, of course, the pressures of coming to the U.S. and the, the system itself that creates these unnatural barriers uh, creates incentives for people to lie and cheat. And the old law used to have a very reasonable discretionary waiver. If you've committed a fraud, uh, we can forgive it if the equities are on your side, ultimately. The, the, the most recent law uh, basically eliminated that kind of a waiver, made it very, very difficult to be forgiven. And of course, culturally, the U.S. focus on truth uh, you know, is, is a little bit out of step with the way the world works and the way that many countries work, particularly when you do deal with officials. So this is an area I would say also uh, requires reform. Um, the, the, the whole consular absolutism, which, you, which is the term immigration lawyers use for what you described, where the consul can say no and not give any reason, uh, is terrible. It's not, it's not in accordance with our legal traditions in this country, but it's been around for a long, long time. Um, and there should be more reasonable procedure uh, in all types of law for, for, for decisions to be reviewed. Uh, not to say that some decisions have to be made with you know, instinct and, and gut feeling and they're not totally rational and can't be proven one way or the other, but there should be a way to review decisions, uh, to have another pair of eyes look at them, and to have some answering to or some accountability for the decisions that are made. Uh, the consulates, the U.S. immigration um, are like many other organizations we come in contact in our daily lives. You know, the internet is a great thing, but it allows people to become remote as well because they can hide behind the They don't give you a phone number. Uh, you can't reach them. Uh, so this is a, a ploy that the U.S. consulates have long used, and, and modern technology, I'm afraid, makes this even worse, that uh, you can't really talk to somebody most of the time. So what my perspective on this would be that uh, we do need to understand uh, what our needs are in the country. We do need to expand our vision of the types of workers that we need in this country. We do need to recognize that immigrants do create a great economic value in society. Not only do they uh, 
they don't, they don't take uh, wealth away from Americans. In fact, uh, they're doing jobs that most people who are already here are not able or willing to do. But they also help people move up in the, in the ladder. And of course, um, that comes to the last thing that is in dire need of reform is some type of program to legalize uh, the illegals that are already here. So that, that's a point where I would debate a little bit with you, Brian. Is it good to have a society where you have people who are in the underground, even if they're legal, they're, they're second class citizens because they're not citizens, they're not part of the society. Um, not that you're necessarily advocating that, but um, it, it's, not, it's not helpful that there are so many people in this country, uh, eight or nine million, I, I suppose, who are illegal, who don't really have a path to become legal. And there should be a way for them to become legal. Uh, it shouldn't necessarily be an amnesty, but it should be based on uh, employment skills, perhaps English, perhaps some of the things that Brian was mentioning, to allow people to legalize, to help them pay their taxes, which they should be doing, and they will also begin to move up in society economically uh, as a result of that. So th those are my thoughts about um, the immigration law. Thank you. Hello, I realize that some people have to leave and I will not take that personally. Um, as you leave, but my name is Marjorie Hazeltine, and I am a performance studies scholar, which means that I use the tools of theater to investigate social and cultural communication practices. And um, so some of you might not be familiar with the performance studies angle, but that is the way that I'm going to look at the way that immigration policy and legal mandates come to rest on human bodies and the way that then we have to deal with that baggage that Chris said so nicely, how in the legal process that baggage comes to play and how it comes out to play in terms of the way that immigration judges make credibility determinations in refugee cases. If you come to the US and you've been persecuted in your country of origin, you may go through the route to get political asylum or refugee status. And I'm going to be exploring that particular site and talking about the way that credibility in that particular site must be performed and enacted so that the immigration judge can read you, the applicant, as credible. So we've been talking about borders in terms of geography, economics, and we've touched a little bit upon the idea of the us and the them. And I want to think about borders in that way, as the way that we structure our reality since we were these, these primitive tribal beings that we needed to have an us to feel safe. And us, we create all the time. We have borders where we close our doors at night because we want to keep our family in and everyone else out. We have borders uh, for the campus. Once you come on campus, you're a Spartan or you're a visitor. And the sense of borders, really, we can find it in all different ways that we structure our lives. And when we, when we look at how we define the them, we can then start to look at how we're defining the us. And a lot of times we define ourselves in terms of opposition. Who are we not? The notion of American is frequently associated with uh, the huddled, we're saving the huddled masses, you know, the Statue of Liberty. You know, she says like, bring me your poor, you're tired, you're hungry. And that's all well and good. We really like to think of ourselves a lot of times as this national mentality of savior. Where there is a wrong, we will right it, and we want you to bring us your huddled masses. And yet, as Brian talked about, we know we have immigration policies that are set up specifically to keep people out. So then we beg the question of who do we then let in? And I've heard a lot of people say, well, let's let in the good people. The people who are morally upstanding, hard workers, the ones who are going to be good Americans. And where I come in is I say, how do we find them? And how do we tell whether or not they are good Americans? How do we tell whether or not these are credible people who can be trusted? And my research focused particularly on the site of refugee, the refugee case and getting asylum. Because in this particular instance, a lot of refugee 
applicants, asylum seekers, do not have documentation to corroborate their claims. And we are a very text-based society, and a lot of times if you have a very hard, tight case where you have proof that you have been regimentally persecuted or that you can pinpoint what group politically persecuted you and it's not safe to return, if you have that documentation, a lot of times that really helps you. But when you're fleeing your country, oftentimes you come with nothing. And all you have is your story and you don't have the means or the legal expertise to figure out how to get it. So many asylum seekers often find themselves sitting before an asylum officer or an immigration judge and they are told, tell me what happens to you. What they are not told is that there is a whole regimentation of codified behaviors that you must enact in order to be read as a credible subject. The immigration judge is faced with two main tasks. One, to figure out if you do indeed meet the definition of refugee, which is that you have a well-founded fear of persecution, that if you return to your country, you will be persecuted based on your race, religion, your nationality, your political opinion, or your membership in a social group. That's the first task. But the second task is they have to decide whether or not you are to be trusted. And that always underlines every single case. So, how you present yourself, how you tell your story, how the judge sees you, your physical mannerisms become markers of your inner characteristics. Your truthfulness can be seen on your face. Your truthfulness can be seen in your gestures. And through investigating those expectations that we have for refugees, what specific codified actions we want them to perform, we can learn what we expect Americans to be. We oftentimes don't have to face those similar things, but immigration judges and the asylum process is like a metaphorical gate. And the judges are the gatekeeper who decides what particular enactments of credibility we're going to let in and not. In numerous cases, applicants have um, there have been notations in their appellate cases, they were seen as not credible because they have shifty eye contact. It's like... Or perhaps they're not speaking clearly. Perhaps they don't follow a clear narrative structure. Perhaps they get off track. Perhaps they're shaking. These things read as indicators of a lack of credibility on their part. Also, sometimes um, people do not you show emotion correctly. I interviewed one woman who went through the uh, immigration interview process several times, and the first time she told about being raped. And she was very effusive with her emotions, and they said, you're hysterical, I can't understand you. She went back for a second interview. They said, you're too stoic, I can't believe that you were raped, you're not showing me any emotion. And the last time she had to figure out the right balance for her to read as credibly emotional. And it becomes challenging when individuals who have experienced persecution and therefore trauma need to re recount these stories. And numerous studies have been done on the way that our brains code memory when we are traumatized. And a lot of times it's not nice, clear narrative structures. And sometimes we can't remember those things at all, and yet it's that very story of persecution and trauma that will potentially save our lives. People sometimes mistrust government institutions, and rightly so, if they have been persecuted by the government in their own countries, or they have different codes for what reads as respectful. I worked with a group of Somalian refugees, and the young girls would cover their, their mouths when they talked to me as a sign of respect. And it was hard to teach them English because I couldn't really see what they were saying. But I didn't feel like it was appropriate to say, take your hand away. And yet, that behavior would read as evasive. Like, why are you covering your mouth? What are you trying to hide? Transcripts show that judges often get really frustrated with people. And a lot of these immigration judges are overworked, facing a lot of pressures. In 2005, a lot of the, um, the systems for dealing with refugees were cut back. And um, in one case, a Ghanaian refugee woman, Lorraine Fiaggio, was trying to tell about her experience in Ghana, and the judge said, quote, ma'am, I don't like it when someone beats around the bush, okay, when they don't answer me. Another thing I don't like is when somebody makes sounds as if they're crying and their eyes stay dry, all right? 
It's a form of histrionics, and I don't like it. I want straight answers, and I want straight answers right now. You said your father beat and raped you at age seven. How long did that go on while you were at age seven? So we can see here that Lorraine Fiaggio is not crying right, because there's no tears. Clearly, this woman is faking it. In the case Zhu Young Zhang versus the INS in 2004, a mandate that has been referenced almost 2,000 time, times in other cases was set. It says, the immigration judge has the unique advantage among all officials involved in the process of having heard directly from the applicant. A fact finder who assesses testimony together with witness demeanor is in the best position to discern, often at a glance, whether a question that may appear poorly worded on the printed page, in fact, confusing or well understood by those who heard it, whether a witness who hesitated in response was nevertheless attempting truthfully to recount what he recalled of key events or struggling to remember the lines of a carefully crafted script, and whether inconsistent responses are the product of innocent error or intentional falsehood. Reviewing courts have long recognized that a witness may convince all who hear him testify that he is disingenuous and untruthful, yet his testimony, when read, may convey a most favorable impression. In 2005, the Real ID Act instituted that a judge may deem you not credible based on your candor, your demeanor, or your responsiveness. Beg some questions about what that means, what criteria the judges are using to determine that. And usually, that's not the only factor, but if they don't believe you from the start, it can really tank your whole case. And this section also calls attention to another aspect of presenting testimony in the asylum process, the idea of performing a script. And I want you to know that in the actual text, script is in quotation marks. Asylum applicants can be deemed not credible if you forget a name, a date, if you say something out of order. So if it was me, you best believe I'm going to write those things down and I'm going to memorize every single little thing. But if you sound too robotic, too rehearsed, that you are performing a script, they think you're faking, that you're lying. So then we put this double burden. Perform a script, but not a script. Rehearse until you don't sound rehearsed. And then we beg the question, how can then we use these standards to evaluate truthfulness? If truthfulness is a production of artifice. So borders, as we see, are not just physical lines. They are a way of thinking, a baggage that goes back farther than we can remember. And we look at the ref side of refugee testimony as a way to see how are we defining the them and how are we defining the us. Our expectations for good and moral citizens come to play when we judge others' truthfulness based on their candor, demeanor, and responsiveness. We have the idea that truth can be found and I can see it on your face. It also brings to mind that border legislation never just keeps people out. It also serves as a structure for us to how we define ourselves. And who is worthy to be an American? And how do we perform credible American? And in creating and enforcing these expectations, we gain insight into the expectations that we have for credibility, American, and how to perform the credible us. Thank you. Can we get one more round of applause for all of our speakers, please? We now have three awards to give out. We had uh, contestants write an essay for some questions that we drafted, and we have the awardees. Hello. Um, this year we had a special contest for an essay on talking about immigration, and we received very good essays. I just want to present them with an award and so that they come up. Um, the first award will go to Gonzalo Moya. Gonzalo? Please come up. The next award, this is very special. For the first time, we will have uh, two first place winners. We, yeah. We took some time out and we read them and we could not find out which one was clearly stood out from the other. So all of us decided to present to first place award. 
The first award goes to Caroline Lee. And the other award goes to Ruth Orpenza. I guess she's not here, so thank you. We're going to now move on to the question and answer part. We are going to start with our uh, panelist of students. I think we'll just go ahead and start with Tony. Don't forget to use your mic. Excellent. First, I, I got to say thanks for the Bart or the Homer and Homer Simpson uh, cartoons. That good way to break the ice. I, I do have. Um, Several questions, uh, but I will start with just one uh, for Pre Professor Kaplan. Uh, this is a bit of a complicated question. So, uh, a, a government which fails to implement a system which enforces immigration laws by rationalizing for a completely open border is semi-equivalent to a government that condemns, through the use of eminent domain, a citizen's private property for public use. In Pole Town Neighborhood Council versus City of Detroit, and the Pole Town condemnations dram dramatically illustrate the danger of taking inflated estimates of economic benefits at face value. Whatever the general merits of such confidence in the political process, it is seriously misplaced in situations in which politically powerful interest groups can employ the powers of government at the expense of the relatively weak citizens. Both business interests and political leaders dependent on the support of municipalities have tremendous incentives to overestimate the economic benefits of projects furthered by condemnation. For complete discussion, I, I don't mean to hit you with this, but for complete discussion on eminent domain, see Soman 2010, uh, page 127 through 129 in the pursuit of justice. If citizenry is a derivative of politics and politics is a derivative of government, and according to Lopez 2010, page 10 in the pursuit of justice, the government's chief function is, a, is to protect private property. How would you reconcile the extractive benefits non-citizens receive with the costs imposed upon citizens and their livelihoods on the margin? Hmm. Well, let's see, I'll put it in what I think of as layman's terms, all right, so you've been with the reference to this uh, infamous Pole Town eminent domain case uh, where <clears throat> the argument was that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, since the, uh, the you know, I think, I, let's see, again, I'm sure you know more about the case than I do, but I think, you know, so the economic and especially the tax benefits of bulldozing a Polish section of, where was it, Chicago? Or let's see, Michigan, uh, were, de were deemed to be greater than the benefits of allowing it to be there, and so uh, they were, uh, their homes were taken away from them, and they were given compensation, which uh, they probably wouldn't have taken themselves. And uh, you use this as an example of how uh, the you know, politically powerful interest groups are able to use the rationale of economic benefits in order to trample the rights of politically weak citizens. And then you wonder what the, you know, how this can be reconciled with protecting private property. You know, what I would say is that open borders you know, is required if you're going you know, is required if you're going to allow private property uh, because what what you know what do immigration restrictions really say? It says I can't employ you on my own property, I can't rent you my own apartment, I can't let you into my own store just because the government doesn't give you a piece of paper. So you know, the the idea of open borders is not that people can come and trespass on your home. It's the idea that if you would like to invite someone who doesn't have a piece of paper into your home, you're, it is legal for you to do so, and you can't be punished for doing it. So I mean, I I would say that restrictions on immigration are a major abuse of private property. There are while there are many people who don't wish to rent their homes to immigrants, uh, there are plenty who plenty who do. There's many people who don't want to hire immigrants, but plenty who do. And I say these laws are an abridgment of their freedom. Uh, I mean, in terms of trampling the interests of the politically weak, saying so, you know, if anyone is politically weak, it is low-skilled people in the third world whose interests are totally ignored. Right? People can be eating dirt in Haiti, literally, and is there any move to say, let's go and let in as many as we can because they could have a perfectly decent life here without hurting anyone? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, let them eat dirt. Thank you. Sure. I, 
I'd first like to thank the speakers today. They were all wonderful. And I'd like to actually ask Marjorie a question, Professor Hazeltine. Um, I apologize ahead of time. My question will not be as complex as Tony's. Um, so it's only one sentence. I'm going to ask, why did you decide to study immigration credibility, and how has it affected you personally and professionally? Thank you for the question, Jeremiah. Um, no problem. So I first came to the questions of immigration policy because of an Iraqi immigrant who my grandmother's friend happened to meet in Jordan, and he was a political refugee and came to Phoenix and didn't know anyone and had her phone number and called her, and I was 14 at this time, and she ended up started hel started helping him, and he now um, rents a room at her house, and he, we went through a lot of cultural um, shifts. I thought he was, mis he was misusing my grandma. I didn't know if, like, who is this man, and why is he doing this, and so it helped me as a teenager um, figure out my own cultural biases and figure out where was the disconnect happening between the two of us and he was patient and much older than I was as a late 20s man so he was patient with me as a 16 year old girl who thought when um, he was complimenting me that he was calling me fat. So I had to, in college and in my grad work, I had to figure out, I had questions about where was that those cultural tensions happening. And also we had gone through the process of um, as a family of helping him get citizenship. And that raised a lot of legal questions for me about the process, and it became very personal. The, it wasn't just something I read about, I just couldn't, some things didn't seem right, or they didn't seem to rest with me, and I needed to know why. And so that's what drove me to start making live performance and do interviews about refugee asylum, and I was very disturbed by the whole refugee crisis in Iraq and disturbed by the amount of people that were not being let in, and questioned the US's ethical responsibility to immigrants and to refugees in Iraq. So then I started looking at particular instances of people gaining, trying to gain refugee status and came across this strange little clause that you can be deemed not credible based on your presentation of testimony. And as a performance scholar, I was just like, what? So then I thought, this really need some investigation. And I worked with people who are also asking these questions and um, going through all different avenues that I could think of to try and think why was this put into writing in 2005? And how does that work within discourses of terrorism? And how does it work within discourses of our own fear of the other? That's about it. Uh, yeah, this is a question for Mr. Fleshhood. Um, you referred to the political opposition to attempts to reform the system. Um, I th my, at least my observation is a lot of that is due to the fear of uh, American citizens that um, people from elsewhere are going to come and, and take their jobs or reduce their wages or go on welfare or use educational services and health care services. Um, would it help to use a system like is used in Canada and Australia uh, where they um, award points to applicants based on their um, educational background and their um, ability to contribute to society, to society um, to, would that help overcome some of the political opposition that you're seeing? Well, I, I don't know if, if I, I think the political opposition you're talking about is, is more in the, from this gut problem that we mentioned of uh, the fear of the other. And um, I think in a lot, large uh, case, it's also based on ignorance of the economic realities of what migration does, and actually the benefit that immigrants are bringing to the U.S. And uh, you know, every person working in the economy is creating, I, I think, a multiplier effect at some level uh, because they're also creating jobs for others. And um, and uh, so, I, I think the Canadian system uh, the, that's a system where there are 
points given that are not necessarily a single criterion for who gets in, but a kind of a, a range of things. So you don't necessarily have to have everything, but if you have enough, including uh, language, skills, relatives, it's kind of, it's all added up together. Uh, I think that's a, a reasonable type of model that, that could be used. Uh, at the same time, I think we need to focus on specific areas where we really have need for, for people. Uh, and so the system should really deal with how do we have visas for farm workers and lower skilled workers, seasonal workers, but also how do we have visas for highly educated PhDs and scientists. And so I, I think there are also um, specific needs that maybe a point system doesn't always reflect. Uh, but these are all things that need to be studied. I think the important thing is to, is to do something to improve the system and, and to recognize that um, I think uh, to recognize that a restrictive viewpoint is really a reaction from the past and it's not helping to build the country for the future. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, since I was flown here to be provocative, I've got a question for Christopher. All right, so I mean, as, as a practicing attorney, it seems that you must have seen far more horror stories than I know about, and yet you still call the system pretty reasonable. I just don't see anything reasonable about the system that we have. You might say that it could be even worse, but, but to say, look, Brian wants to hire someone from Mexico to take care of his kids. She wants to work for me. She's going to live in my house. What's the problem? And then there's someone who works for the immigration authority says, sorry, you can't do it. Right? And I said, why? And they said, well, we got a whole lot of reasons. We don't have to explain them to you exactly, but you could appeal. And look, why shouldn't I just be able to hire her? Why does the immigration authority get to have any say it over it all? It does not seem reasonable that they do. Well, I, I guess, I, I mean, I agree with you that, that the reasonable system is, is not working reasonably. But, but what I'm trying to say is that I, I think the system comes from two, two, two foundations. One is uh, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a presumption or there's a foundational concept, which I believe you disagree with, that, that it would not be a good thing for, for the country to let in everybody. I mean, I think that's, that's at the root of it, and I think that needs to be examined. But, but I also think that really, if you say open the doors tomorrow and let a billion people in, uh, I really think that politically that would be un, untenable in the United States. Uh, I mean, I don't think people would, would accept that idea. So, so I, I do think there's a foundation that there has to be some level of regulation. Um, the system is trying to so the, the system as it exists does not account for the, the lower paid worker. And I absolutely agree with you. And that's, that's irrational today because we need those lower skilled, lower paid workers. We need those lower skilled workers, I should say. Um, and, but the idea of the system was we don't need those people. The idea was we should be protecting American labor, the American working person who wants to be able to work in those jobs. And therefore, the visas we give should be for people with unique skills, not few skills. And the problem with that is it, it, does, not, it, it, it does not reflect the actual needs of society today. So in that sense, I agree with you, it's not a reasonable system. But I think that the idea of having a system, if you will, is not unreasonable. Let's uh, move on to audience questions. If you have one, Alex will trot over to you and hand you a microphone. Hi, I'm David Thomas. I'm an economics grad student here at San Jose State. Um, I'm also a uh, first generation American, and my wife's, uh, two of my wife's grandparents immigrated from Mexico. I have dual citizenship, and uh, I spent the first 25 years of my, uh, actually, first 40 years of my life in Arizona. And Arizona is like the big controversy in immigration, I think, of all the states. And um, I've heard, I saw your and heard your arguments why people are against 
these things. But what I didn't see up there is probably the biggest issue if you were there on the streets in Arizona talking to people, and that is uh, the crime level that has risen so dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, for the first, up until about 20 years ago, immigration coming from Mexico into Arizona was welcomed. Uh, farming, jobs were available for them, uh, everything was great, and then in the last 20 years, they've had about 50,000 uh, immigrants who are part of organized crime who have come across and have really disrupted uh, the community there. I was just wondering how you might address that sort of an issue. Uh, sure. So uh, perhaps we shouldn't raise multiple controversies in one, uh, in, or one, one, let's see, provoke more than, on more than one issue, but uh, I would blame the drug war. I say things, drugs should be legal, and if drugs were legal, then I think these problems would basically go away, just like they did under prohibition of alcohol and when it was repealed. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you know, social scientists have worked on the question of whether or not immigrants are especially prone to crime, and the surprising answer is that they're not. Uh, there may be certain pockets where that's true, but on average it's not true. Right? And a lot of it is just that when an immigrant commits a crime, people see it as proof that immigrants are evil, whereas when an American does it, it's a proof that there are a few bad apples. I have a question to either of the panelists, or all three of the panelists. Um, as I understand it, we had the Bracero program, which essentially was a guest worker program from uh, World War II, I think, to 1964, if I recall correctly. And through my research, it seems to indicate that part of the problem we have with the illegal immigrants is because we, quote unquote, closed the border, we've made it so difficult to come across the border to work, and yet there's the demand for the labor, the farm uh, owners want the cheap labor, and yet, because we've made it so difficult to go back and forth, uh, they come over here. And because it's so difficult to go back and forth, now they smuggle the wife and the kids. And all of a sudden, now they're a burden on the education system, the welfare system, the health care system. But prior to, quote unquote, closing the border, at the end of the harvest season, they typically went home. They typically did not bring the spouse and the kids. So it seems to me that our government's policy has actually enhanced or even created the situation, and I'd like you guys to, uh, to comment on that. Well, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think you're right about that. I think that uh, not having a, a program for agricultural workers and other seasonal workers, um, they're going to come in anyway, but it's going to be harder, and there's going to be a lot more trauma in doing so. And then they're not likely to go back because it's so, e so difficult to return again. So I think if you had a regularized visa program, which we do to some extent, it's just not extensive enough and it's not working well enough uh, for those types of jobs, I think those people generally would go home. People don't necessarily go other places just, you know, people don't necessarily need to migrate to other countries permanently. Um, and a lot of people in Mexico would, would probably go back after the, the season, just as you say. So I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I agree too. Again, uh, I, my first choice is always open borders, no regulation. But if you're going to have some regulation, I'd rather that it be looser and uh, make, it more, make it possible for more people to come, make it easier. I have a question for Marjorie Hazeltine. Um, we know uh, Chris Fleischert's um, uh, take on immigration, unrestricted immigration. What is your take on unrestricted immigration? And if you, in fact, do not favour unrestricted immigration, what criteria would you use for prohibiting the entry of some people into the United States? I mean, this is a question that always plagues the research where you come to the end and you say, okay, I found all of these things and it's easy to say, okay, these are very problematic, but where do we go from here? And my specific research, I'm not able to speak about um, all of immigration borders, but particularly in the refugee um, asylum realm, I believe that a big issue is dealing with issues of trauma and that immigration judges, many of them, there's a huge disparity between the amount of people that one judge in one district will let in versus another judge in another district. 
And a study called Refugee Roulette found that just where you end up being dropped off will have a huge impact on whether or not you get asylum or not. And you could be a judge who grants 2%, or you could be in a district where the judge grants 20%. And I think um, to determine more than anything, not whether or not someone is a moral, uh, morally upstanding citizen, but whether or not they meet the definition of refugee. And I think more emphasis needs to be put on whether or not that person was persecuted, whether or not they fear persecution if they return. And some of the places where I would advocate reform and that have been, currently are being advocated in Congress, is granting legal representation for refugees. Right now they are not, they may have it if they wish, but they would have to pay for it or find a pro bono organization. So first to, um, if we're going to keep the current system, to have training programs set up for refugees to know what cultural norms are and to learn them. And that doesn't necessarily rest with me morally, but it would be a pragmatic uh, solution. And on a broader scheme, what I would want is to have different training for immigration judges, to have more immigration judges, and to have those immigration judges be well-versed in cultural forms of performance of self, and to be able to be patient, which is the, the immigration system just isn't set up for. You know, somebody could take six months to be able to recall an event that happened, and then another six months to be able to even talk about it, another year to be able to talk about it coherently. And the system requires that if you want to do affirmative refugee, uh, to get refugee status affirmatively, you have to go within the first year. And I think that there's a lot of hidden requirements that I found are used as ways to just get people through. Oh, you're not credible, you're not credible. You can be dismissed for anything. And the appellate board under John Ashcroft was reduced from one, three judges to one. And a lot of times, if it's an issue of credibility, they're like, oh, I can't see it, so I'm not there. And I think to have, um, I've, I've thought about means of videotaping testimony so that somebody can rewatch it. I think for me, I would say the issues of letting people, refugees in, needs to be more attentive to the trauma that people have been through, set up not to simply that the truth is out there and you can find it, but recognize the fact that a lot of times that um, what we see as truthful is not actually truthful. So training, um, potentially to be able to uh, give people legal representation and psychiatric help before they go before a judge and face deportation. But a lot of people can, if they face deportation, people think that they get refugees, try to get refugee status as the last, uh, their last kind of attempt to order to stay in the country, and they're very suspicious of that. So there's no easy answers, but I think a big thing comes down to uh, going more on whether or not this person is persecuted, whether or not they're a good person. Hey, Marjorie, so it seems like you've seen a lot more sad stories than I have. Mm -hmm. How can you look at all these sad stories and not just say, let them all in? Why do we have to torture people, make them recount these horrible things that happened to them before a stranger who can sit there and pretend like he can judge what's in their hearts mm -hmm. instead of just saying, you're all in? Or, if that's too strong, how about say, fine, let the U.S. government prove they're lying? You can come in unless we can prove that you are lying. Right? How about that? Yeah, I, mean, gosh. <laughs> I would say let them all in. That is what I personally would say. <laughs> I don't think that there should, I think that if you have faced that persecution, I think the system is really messed up. It traces back to the idea of the elocutionists. It traces back to mental hygienists that somehow the way you speak is indicative of who you are on the inside. And I don't think, I think let them all in. But I also think that what Chris said is that I don't, I would think that's great. Is that going to happen? I don't know. I love to be in this thought experiment and say, yeah, that would be amazing. But in the meantime, is there work where I can use my expertise to help people navigate a system until that day comes? I believe so. Professor Kaplan, um, within the Within the current legal framework, uh, I think Mayor Bloomberg suggested that we allow unrestricted immigration as long as they stay in Detroit. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on that and uh, mobility restrictions in general within the current legal framework. 
Yes, as scary as you might think Detroit is, uh, for most people on Earth, it would be a huge improvement. And if that's all we're willing to do, I think that's way better than what we're doing now. I mean, I think Haiti would empty to Detroit if it were legal. Seriously, it's that bad. I, w I would say, though, that in our system, it's not legal to uh, restrict people in certain parts of the U.S. Um, my question is for Professor Kaplan. Um, so we've talked about the benefits mainly for those who immigrate to the U.S., but I was also wondering about um, the people that they leave behind in their country. And from the current restrictions and some of the alternative restrictions that you were talking about, it seems that the people who would be able to come here would be the people who are more willing and able to pay. So those are the more talented people or the more uh, knowledgeable people. Um, and how do we make sure that we don't drain the countries that they're coming from of their most talented people? Um, if you had anything to say about that. Uh, sure, so that's a very good question. Uh, the answer is it is very much in the interest of people in third world countries that we let in as many people as possible because people who come here from third world countries send home remittances. That is a lot of money. Uh, more money goes to the third world in remittances than is paid in all foreign aid. Right, so you know, you're just letting in one worker from Haiti, he can support an entire family and more back home just by sending some money home. So again, while you, while you, while you might think you know, the talent is being drained, well, the talent is being drained to a place where the talent is paid a lot more. And then they can take that money and send it home to help the people who really need it. Uh, this question is uh, uh, for Professor Kaplan. Um, Oh, oh, wait, wait, Chris, did you want to respond to the? Well, I was just going to comment that, you know, there's a recent story, I think, just this week about the, the reverse immigration of highly skilled uh, computer uh, Silicon Valley professionals back to India and China. And so not only do people, not only does immigration help countries by people sending money back, but they also eventually send their expertise back. And it, it does help uh, improve the world everywhere, I think. Okay, so my question is, um, in your presentation, you had several uh, humane alternatives to just saying no to immigration, mm -hmm. um, such as not allowing, I guess, work benefits um, or employment benefits, and then also um, possibly charging to come into the country or um, not having the right to vote. How would you respond to people that their current concern is, well, once those people are in here, and once they become more established, they start to, um, those people start to champion or rally to get those rights. And, you know, people that have a fear that eventually they'll um, start to move towards uh, getting equal rights as any U.S. citizen would have, or is that not really a concern? Hmm. Right, so, I mean, so uh, the question, as I'm understanding you, is um, you know, it's what economists would call a time consistency problem, where someone may, may say, look, I promise I won't vote, but when they show up, are they going to start agitating the vote? Uh, again, over the span of decades, that might eventually be an issue, although I say by that point, the, they probably assimilated, and it's just not that big of a deal. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, the other, but I think actually a more like the result is just that it undermines support for the, for a lot of the programs that we have, because when you see that someone who showed up in Haiti is here shining shoes and not getting any help from the government, the idea that someone who was born here who had a lot of, who had far more opportunities does deserve your help does start to sound kind of odd. Right? And we just realize how many people would love to come here and work in the lowest skilled job and wouldn't, wouldn't complain about it, and then think about Americans who feel so much more entitled so much more. Right? I think it would, would weigh on us, but... Again, I think as as to you know what the, what the you know the direction of the evolution would be, I think actually in many ways would be positive. I think it might put things in a new light and realize that uh, people who are born here and complain about how tough their lives are are probably not really appreciating how many advantages they've had. We um, have time for one more question. Go ahead. Um, my question is for Dr. Kaplan. Um, you've alluded to the fact that you want all border basically control removed, people can come freely in any amount of number. You've also talked about how there's an us and them mentality and negative attitude towards immigrants, especially undocumented or illegal immigrants. Couldn't the fact that millions of people coming here that are viewed as us and our attitude towards 
them as being different coupled together create a huge amount of conflict within our nation and ultimately just create more problems. Also adding the stress of millions of people coming in and consuming our resources, living in our cities. Couldn't this ultimately just make things a whole lot worse? I mean, I don't see much sign of actual conflict. In the 19th century, you know, Chinese immigrants got lynched. There was actual violence in the streets. Uh, now we are more civilized, and I just don't see much sign of that. In terms of immigrants coming and consuming our resources, well, uh, they're consuming resources of people who pay them for their services. Uh, that's the main way it works. Uh, so you hire someone, uh, they do something for you then, you, then they get the money and they buy something with it. Uh, the, again, the key economic point is both parties to the exchange are better off uh, because it was a voluntary trade. So again, you know, like, you know, if I hire an immigrant, they don't go and consume your resources. Uh, they consume my resources, but I'm happy that they are doing so because they're doing something for me uh, in exchange. Again, you know, could we imagine that if a whole bunch of other things change, that then there'd be a you know, Planet of the Apes type struggle? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's possible, uh, but seems far-fetched and seems like a, like a very fantastic scenario to use to say that someone can't come here and get a job. If you want any more information on the program, uh, feel free to come up and talk with any of us. Again, all of us were corralled by Dr. Ortega, so haunt her doorstep. She's in the uh, Dudley Moorhead building, economics department, uh, lower level, I forget which room. Uh, if you'd like to be part of this next semester, we are continuing it as far as I know. <laughs> I'm not graduating, so I'll be around. Um, anyway, if you like more information, Come up and talk to us. Thank you.